The Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington presents World Focus, a continuing series on international political, social, economic, and cultural issues. I'm Joe Butwin of the Department of English and the Jewish Studies Program in the Jackson School at the University of Washington. The Samuel and Althea Straum annual lectures in Jewish Studies have been really the uh, center of the Jewish Studies Program at the University since its beginning in 1975. Those lectures have included the work of such luminaries of Jewish thought as Irving Howe, Aaron Applefeld, Yehuda Bauer. Many of the lectures have been published by the University of Washington Press so that what we know of them in Seattle has really been spread throughout the world. Tonight, I'd like to introduce Ruth Weiss. Ruth Weiss is a professor of Jewish and American literature at, uh, the, at McGill University in Montreal. Her subject for three lectures is the Yiddish writer I.L. Peretz, and her title for the three lectures, Creative Survival, the Making of Modern Jewish Culture. It's totally appropriate that Peretz should be put at this, uh, at the, as a centerpiece of such a study. Uh, he, along with Shalom Aleichem, is really the main figure of Yiddish writing in Eastern Europe before the war. Any study of Peretz's work in that period is, in effect, what Professor Weiss has described it as, the center and indeed the origin and for many the sad conclusion of Jewish modern culture in Eastern Europe in this century. Thank you. I, um, I have chosen to speak about parrots and um, this uh, talk begins uh, in his midlife. About the year 1888, Leon Labush Peretz, a highly successful lawyer in his native city, Zamosch, was disbarred following his denunciation to the Tsarist authorities by an unknown informer. And despite his strenuous attempts to clear his name, he was unable to persuade the government to reinstate him. I fell in battle, he wrote to his cousin Moshe Altberg, after futile trips to Warsaw and St. Petersburg and equally fruitless appeals to Gentile friends in the local court. I was unable to prove that I was not a socialist, not an enemy of the government, and not hostile to the Orthodox Church, and that I don't undertake the defense of revolutionary-minded Uniates. The so-called Uniates were suspected by the Tsarist officials of introducing foreign influences into the church and were thus considered as dangerous to the Tsarist ideal of one national religion as the socialists were to the ideal of one autocratic ruler. For 10 years, Peretz had practiced law successfully in the Zamosht region, winning very high respect for his professional competence. He was admired for his intelligence and learning, and not least for his generosity with money. He and his wife kept an open house for modernizing young Jews of the town, whom he served as something of a mentor. In fact, one of Peretz's relatives later wondered if it was his strong influence among Jewish youth that had provoked some of their orthodox parents to try to drive him from the city for fear of his corrupting powers. Whether this was so or not, whoever wanted Peretz out of Zamosch achieved his purpose. Never given the chance to confront his accuser or accusers, Peretz was never certain who had lodged the complaint against him or why it should have been so decisively upheld. He knew only that at the age of 37, 38, he had suddenly lost his livelihood, and he had to look elsewhere for a new source of income. 
From all we know of Peretz's life in Zamosh before this crisis, he seems to have been an energetic, optimistic native son. At a time when a man disclosed his identity in the cut of his beard, Peretz affected the look of a well-to-do Pole. In fact, the stone bust of Count Zamoyski that still stands in the courtyard of the former Zamoyski residence bears him an uncanny resemblance with its deep-set eyes and thick, drooping mustache. Well, the Count's resemblance to Peretz may be pure coincidence, but Peretz resembled the Count because he had chosen to. There were many other signs of Peretz's adaptation to Polish society. He conducted the courtship of his second wife, Helena Ringelheim, in Polish, which remained the language of their home. The son of his first marriage, Lucian, who was under his care, he had sent to the larger city of Plotsk to be educated in Polish. He subscribed to the Israelita, the Polish language Jewish newspaper, and he even discovered Yiddish literature in a Polish translation. The only works of modern Yiddish literature he seems to have known were Sholem Abramovich's Masoy's Binyomin Hashlishi, The Travels of Benjamin III, and Die Klatsche, The Mayor, The Old Horse, which he had read in the Polish translations of Clemens Junosza. Peretz had come to maturity during the brightest years of Polish positivism, when the faith in universal education, technological pro progress, and productive labor inspired high hopes of rational human improvement. He was encouraged by the liberal attitude of the publicist Alexander Świętochowski and um, a number of important Polish writers to believe that the Jews would be rewarded for their industry and their loyalty by the respect of their fellow Poles. His sudden experience of injustice was not only a severe blow to his pride and his pocketbook, but to his understanding of himself as a member of Polish society. By expelling him from the ranks of lawyers, the Tsarist government bureaucracy drove him from the profession that he would probably otherwise have practiced to the rest of, for the rest of his life. The year 1888 happens to be famous in the annals of Yiddish literature for another reason. Though the fortunes of the Yiddish press were then at very low ebb, the editorship of the single Yiddish weekly newspaper of the Tsarist Empire, the Yiddishes Volksblatt of St. Petersburg, having passed into the hands of a certain Yisroel Levy, who compared Yiddish to castor oil, a necessary purgative, this was the year in which Sholem Rabinovich launched a Yiddish annual called the Yiddish Volksbibliothek that established Yiddish belles lettres as a major cultural force. Sholem Rabinovich, better known as Sholem Aleichem, at 28, some nine years younger than Peretz, was then still in possession of the considerable fortune that he and his wife had inherited upon the death of her father, and he determined to put this money at the service of the new literature by editing a quality journal. He sent out a call for Yiddish material to the well-known Jewish writers in Russia and Poland, including some who had never before published in Yiddish, promising generous honoraria. Sholem Aleichem's address in Kiev, the Ukrainian capital that was outside the Jewish pale of settlement, and his respectful attitude towards Yiddish writers and Yiddish writing marked a significant departure from the ephemeral and apologetic nature of all earlier Yiddish undertakings. Through a third party, the call for Yiddish material reached Peretz in Zamosch. Peretz was known at the time only as a Hebrew writer and an irregular one at that. At 22, he had written a small collection of verses in Polish, which was never published. And three years later, he had co-published with the father of his first wife, a collection of poems in Hebrew. Then for 10 years, he devoted himself exclusively to the practice of law. Only in 1886 did he resurface as a writer, contributing poems and sketches to Hatsafira and Ha'asif, the leading Hebrew periodicals of the day. He was also known locally as the author of occasional verse in Yiddish, and it may have been this aspect of his literary reputation that prompted a publisher in Berdichev 
to inform him of Sholem Aleichem's project. But we don't know whether Peretz learned of the new publication before or after he was disbarred. His reference in one of his letters to Sholem Aleichem to the sudden decline in his earnings suggests that he was still trying to win reinstatement. The new literary journal, which Peretz said surpassed in its significance everything that has been published in both our literatures, was just the sort of project that by harnessing his energies could help offset his humiliation. He couldn't have considered Yiddish writing as an economic alternative to the practice of law, since, as he wrote to Sholem Aleichem, there wasn't a single Yiddish book to be found in all Zamosh. The only Yiddish writers then profiting from their labor were the incredibly prolific Isaac Mayer Dick and the sensationalist kinds of writers like Shomer, the pseudonym of N. Shaikovich, whose potboilers Sholem Aleichem held to be responsible for lowering public standards. But though not an alternative source of income, Yiddish writing provided Peretz with a new creative challenge. His Hebrew works had attracted some appreciative notice among small circles of enlightened Jews throughout the Pale of Settlement. With his contributions to the Volksbibliothek, Peretz began his uninterrupted career as a Yiddish writer and as it turned out, the most influential Yiddish writer of all time. That Peretz should have taken up Yiddish literature at just the time he suffered a fatal economic and social reversal may be considered symptomatic of contemporary cultural developments. The first generation of East European maskilim had favored the linguistic integration of the Jews into Russian just as their Central European brothers were learning to function in German. They hoped that political progress toward a democratic state would mean equal citizenship for the Jews who would have to demonstrate their readiness for citizenship by adoption of the national language. It was only gradually and largely in reaction to repressive legislation, pogroms, and a Russified populist movement that Jewish intellectuals were persuaded of the need to develop their own cultural resources in their own languages, Yiddish and Hebrew. It stands to reason that modern young Jews like Peretz and Sholem Rabinovich should have aspired to political and social equality. And the fact is that they chose to educate their children in Polish and Russian and to speak and to write to them in those languages revealing their deepest personal hopes for the Jewish future. Had the process of liberalization that began in Russia in the 1860s maintained its hospitable promise, Jewish creativity would in all likelihood have flowed into the host languages as it did wherever toleration flourished elsewhere. That likelihood was never tested. In the same way that Peretz rechanneled his energies into Yiddish writing when his advancement as a lawyer was blocked, so too on a much larger scale, the extraordinary flowering of Yiddish culture at the end of the 19th century was one creative response of the Jews to the obstruction of their political progress. Intensified Yiddish culture was a spontaneous reaction to social repression. At the time Sholem Aleichem initiated the Volksbibliothek, the status of Yiddish was still much lower among Polish Jews than it was in the Russian Pale, among other reasons because the political optimism of Polish Jews had been correspondingly greater. Polish liberalism was significantly more hospitable to the Jews than its Russian counterpart, as long as the Poles expected Jewish help in their struggle for national independence. And this proffered friendliness or expectation of friendliness held out for a longer time the promise of an integrated community of Jewish Poles. Yet even before Peretz was disbarred, the public mood had begun to change. The pogrom in Warsaw following the assassination of Alexander II in 1881 shattered the image of Polish Jewish cooperation that flourished around the time of the 1863 uprising and in its aftermath. The Catholic Church and the conservative nationalists opposed the accommodationist politics of positivism. The church because it weakened the religious basis of Polish peoplehood, 
the nationalists because they still hope to free Poland from the yoke of foreign rule. And from the socialist camp too, there was an attack on the bourgeois spirit of positivism that profited individuals at the expense of the working class. The decline in mutual toleration affected the Jews, who were at that time being squeezed out of their former occupations by the expansion of industry, a changing peasant economy, the rising Polish middle class, and not least, restrictive Tsarist edicts. Peretz described this period as the end of the good years and the beginning of the bad. His own setback, losing his right to practice law, was thoroughly typical of the worsening fate of Polish Jewry. Peretz did more than turn to literature as a result of his dilemma. He turned his dilemma into literature. No longer a young man and with considerable experience behind him, he took up Yiddish writing with the kind of authority that authors normally acquire only after many years of trial and error. Along with the very first manuscripts he sent to Sholem Aleichem, he wrote as follows. Your wish and goal, as far as I understand it, is to write for the sake of the audience that speaks jargon of jargon land, jargon being the commonly used term for Yiddish. I, for my part, write for my own pleasure. And if I take any reader into consideration, he is of the higher level of society, a person who has read and studied in a living tongue. The letter is written, as is all the correspondence between them, in Hebrew which is clearly not the living tongue that Peretz has in mind. If we may paraphrase Peretz's compressed message, it says something like this. Though I now find myself writing, as you do in Yiddish, let me make it clear that I don't consider myself the sort of Yiddish writer that you presumably are, a Yiddish writer who wants to entertain the market women and the synagogue goers whom he writes about. No, I write for someone like myself, a reader and a student of Polish and Russian who may also know German and French and who might even be writing in one of those languages if anti-Jewish hostility had not retarded local Jewish emancipation. Peretz goes on to describe the ways in which his subject and, and approach differ from those of Sholem Aleichem, who presumably writes only about the real world of Jews around him. I who write for my own pleasure and only according to my mood, take my material simultaneously from different worlds. None of this can be taken as a serious comment on Sholem Aleichem, since it turns out from succeeding letters that Peretz was really thinking of Abramovich, Mendele Moicher Svorim, not Rabinovich, Sholem Aleichem, when he formulated these distinctions. And he had never even read a word of the author whom he was characterizing, as he discovered much to his embarrassment. <laughs> but it does express his own literary intentions. He meant to write about himself exactly as he was, which is to say as a mixture of Jew and Pole, and to explore his own conflicts along with those of society. Monish the long poem that he contributed to the first volume of the Yiddish Volksbibliothek is just such a work. We can understand why Sholem Aleichem edited the poem in an attempt to improve it, and why some of the critics found it incomprehensible, including, incidentally, the great historian Shimon Dubnov, because there had never been anything remotely like it in Yiddish. Ir weist min astam, die Welt is a yam, mir sinnen fish, Tales and in Hecht schlingen nicht schlecht, so oft der schon nicht. Die Welt ist ein Jam, breit und aschir. Die Fische sind in mir, der Fischer ist Sam. The world is a sea. We are the fish. Some of us carp know how to swallow. Don't you agree? The world is a sea wide beyond measure. We are the fish. Satan is the fisher. The work was designated a ballad, but its rhythm was staccato and modern, and the balladeer seemed to be speaking in a language all his own. He joked in Yiddish idiom and dropped rabbinic references like a regular Jew. But was he traditional or not? This world of hungry fish was the universe of Hobbes and Darwin, in which our choices are to swallow or be swallowed. But if so, what was Satan, the Satan of the Jewish moral imagination, doing in Darwin's universe? 
As Satan sets his bait in the next few lines, confident that he is going to hook his prey, the reader is not really sure whether to trust the poet when he says that he has come to warn us against evil or to recognize him as the devil's true accomplice. Monish, identified by Peretz with himself as a boy, is a prodigy of the golden age of East European Jewry. Pious father, pious mother, the family one after another, scholars all, known and praised everywhere. And those who know best say they'll all be surpassed by our hero, Monish. Handsome and brilliant, Monish is also good and pure, oblivious to the passions that he arouses in some of the younger women, and unspoiled by the adulation of the great Polish rabbis who recognize him, young as he is, the great mind of their generation, and perhaps even the Aschalta de Geula, the herald of the messianic age. However, perfection is not something that Satan can tolerate. The moment that he is warned by a courier demon that this paragon of Jewish virtue may soon put them out of their evil business, he begins to plot with Lilith, his female counterpart, to corrupt the boy. Tratatata, a wealthy German arrives in town accompanied by his beautiful daughter Maria, and as the father spoils the community with infusions of easy money, the Christian daughter dazzles the locals with her tantalizingly beautiful song. Un as monisch geht kisse der jeden Morgen früh in Cheder, bleibt der Stein beim Teuer. Demol singt a pracht, Marie, und ihr Trellenmelodie dringt ihm tief in euer. Whereas formerly nothing could distract him from his love of study, Monish now lingers at the gate beim Teuer, enchanted by Maria's trilled melody that penetrates deep into his ear in Euer. When he studies, he finds himself using her strange new tune. She is on his mind. She is in his heart. The angels of good and evil realize that a Jewish soul is wavering, and they swoop down to claim him. The good angel reminds him of the glory of God's universe that was created for his sake, and of the awesome responsibility that is his as a Jew. Surely, God's promised 310 worlds should not be put in jeopardy over a girl. But the evil angel offers sly encouragement. God is merciful. When the time comes, you'll repent, and he'll forgive. So one night, Monish conspires to meet Maria where he knows no one will see them at an ancient ruin, the haunt of spirits and rodents. Coy Maria says she would like to believe in the love the Jewish boy says he feels for her, but how can she trust him when men are such consummate deceivers? He swears by his life that he loves her, by his side locks, by his, um, by his earlocks, his phylacteries, the very signs of his Jewish manhood. He swears by his father, by his pious mother and his ancestors before them. Still, she is plagued by doubt. How can she be certain that he will not lead her astray? He swears further by the cloth that covers the synagogue ark and then by the Torah itself. Higher, she urges, higher. She wants to be certain beyond a doubt. And so through gentle teasing, she coaxes him on and on until he swears by the name of God and is struck by the lightning of his rod. Laughter in Gehenna, the satanic orchestra strikes up its merriest tune and the devilkins do the can-can for joy. Satan and his consort Lilith celebrate their triumphal victory. On der Zeit von Teve Teuer by dem Leppo von dem Euer, ungeschlagen Monisch steht. Spire brennt, die Spies is great. So Monish stands nailed by his earlobe to the satanic ark. The fire is hot, the spit is ready. And the echoed rhymes of Teuer and Euer remind us that the innocent ear that once listened enchanted at Maria's gate is now nailed to its doom at Lilith's doorpost. Monish fell to temptation with no, no trace of a struggle. If Monish was the boy Labush, 
than Peretz was telling about his own damnation. And this accounts, I think, for the comic tone of the ballad. The poet who has long since done what Monish did can afford to mock the sermonics of hell because contrary to what he was taught in childhood, he knows that one can sin and survive. You can follow the paths of the Gentiles and fall in love with the Marias and give up your loyalty to the Jewish world and still prosper. Um, as a modern Jew in his own native community, his tongue-in-cheek treatment of the wily Satan reflects the chutzpah of the modern man who safely transgressed all the old taboos and lived to boast about it. Yet from the point of view of that pious world in which Labush and Monish were so tenderly raised, he was damned in earnest and beyond appeal. As a boy of 15, Peretz had discovered European civilization in the form of a private secular library containing the Napoleonic Code, dozens of novels, books of history and philosophy and natural law, and what he learned about literature, law, and love transformed him from a yeshiva bocher into a modern young man. Now, having traded in his Jewish piety for Maria's charms, Peretz was in a position to know how dangerously fickle the Gentile could be, leaving him suspended between a world he had quit and one from which he was excluded. Maybe the joke was on him, and damnation meant knowing that hell was the real world where Maria's contempt was his inevitable reward for falling in love with her. In spite of its comic tone, Monish is a grim and painful parable about the makings of the modern Jew out of complementary acts of betrayal, his betrayal of the past and the future's betrayal of him. Qualities that would come to be recognized as typical of Peretz were already there in Monish and in the prose contributions to the Volksbibliothek. These include the compressed shorthand style that never stops to, ex to uh, explain or to amplify, the unfinished sentence trailing the three dots that became known as Peretz's trademark, the tantalizing mixture of old and new that makes the familiar strange and the strange familiar. What immediately set Peretz's writing apart was its sense of urgency. He was not like the typical Sholem Aleichem narrator, a raconteur with time to spare, but a troubled man with too much on his mind. Riddled by conflicts, he saw everything in dialectical form, every impulse poised against its opposite, every proposition with its challenge. The court from which he had been professionally barred became the recurring seat of his stories, where as prosecutor and counsel, plaintiff and defendant, he represented the warring sides of his own divided self, his own di divided mind and heart. In a story, for example, like Der Meshuganer Batlan, the mad Talmudist of 1890, we see the interior monologue of a bachelor student who is torn by so many conflicting impulses at once that he is drawn to suicide as the only way of resolving them all. And Peretz occasionally succumbed to such black moods himself. He had practiced as a lawyer in Polish courts according to Tsarist laws. As a writer, Peretz had to select his own venue. Jewish law was predicated on the existence of an infallible God, creator of the universe, architect of time and space. It drew its spiritual power from faith in Av HaRachamim, the merciful God who saw into the heart of things even when men were blind and maintained his true and perfect judgment even when human courts were faulty. Because of God's eternity and ubiquity, events of the past had for the Jews an eternal meaning and despair was a sin against the messianic promise. To be a traditional Jew meant to accept to some degree that the perfection of the Jews was a first necessary step in the perfection of the world entire, that the holiness of Monish or Leibush in some remote corner of Poland could well be the Aschalta de Geula. The modern rationalist 
allowed no such transcendence. Moral philosophers like Mill and Marx spoke of the greatest good for the greatest number, of the proper redistribution of wealth and power as the key to goodness and justice. By the light of reason, one could know and function in only the material world. Since there was no promise of perfect judgment to come, one had to improve society according to one's own analysis, prescription, and schedule. This court of human law limited its practitioners to the here and now, to the body politic, to the body of human knowledge. The choice of literary style and setting was therefore crucial to the moral impulse of any story. Let's take a sketch of two yeshiva students whose argument over Gomorrah drowns out the grumbling of their empty stomachs. The court of religious opinion would admire their intellectual passion and recognize in their sublimation of physical needs the triumph of the spirit over the body. The materialist would see in them the deluded victims of an unexistent deity studying outdated laws. He might even want to know how much peasant and woman's labor it took to sustain these economic parasites. Even before his characters were introduced, the Jewish writer had to decide which of these two views he favored because they could not be reconciled. Or could they? Because Peretz could never make his final peace with either of these conflicting claims to truth, he never gave up trying to reconcile them. Meanwhile, as a thoroughly modern husband intent on supporting his wife and family, he had to find a new source of income, having lost his right to practice law. He appealed to friends and relatives to help him find a job, and when nothing permanent turned up, he took on the, um, the temporary job of statistician for the new research bureau that Jan Bloch had set up to collect information about Jews in towns and villages. As one of a team of researchers, he investigated the income and occupation, family structure and military service of Jews around the area of Zamosht and sent back the data to the Central Bureau in Warsaw. This statistical expedition inspired Peretz's first major work of fiction. It gave him intimate knowledge of small town life and material for dozens of literary portraits. Now Jan Bloch's project had a good deal in common with Peretz's earlier attempts to clear his good name before the courts. Along with Leopold Cronenberg, his rival for control of the Polish railroads, Bloch occupied a unique position between Christians and Jews. He was one of the richest and most influential men in the country, whose conversion to Christianity had eased his entry into the Christian society without obscuring his Jewish origins. And this didn't trouble Bloch at all. To the contrary, he shared the liberal conviction of the positivists that any man, Jew or non-Jew, who expanded industry and commerce, as he was unquestionably doing, contributed to the welfare of all Poland, which was made up of diverse ethnic groups. His continuing wholehearted involvement with the Jews showed how comfortable he felt as a Jew of Polish descent. But nevertheless, his optimism had been shaken. Uh, because of the pogrom of 1881, he realized that there was a good deal of anti-Semitism afoot, and he organized the statistical expedition in order to try to convince the government that the Jews were not, in fact, parasites. He tried to convince them on the basis of data that these researchers would actually compile and then offer up as proof. One could say, then, that Bloch was attempting at the national level exactly what Peretz had been trying to do for himself. He was trying to muster credible evidence that the charges against the Jews were false, just as Peretz had tried to convince the government that the charges against him had been false. Little wonder, then, that Peretz did not have a good deal of confidence in Bloch's effort. Having but recently been denied a chance to prove his innocence, he knew that facts were a useless weapon against prejudice and that a scientific survey was not likely to clear persons of the suspicion in which they were held. Nevertheless, he and Nahum Sokolov took on this job and went through the provinces 
And the result of this was um, a, a collection of sketches called the Travel Pictures of a Journey Through the Tomashov District in 1890. These 22 sketches, as it happens, published in 1891, remain the only full account of the original project since all the rest of the material appears to have been lost after Jan Bloch sent the data in 1898 to Theodor Herzl, who was going to incorporate it into a book-length report. Uh, nobody knows what happened to that. And so while Peretz's impressions are avowedly fictional, they probably offer as vivid and valid a description of contemporary Jewish life in the provinces as the social scientists might have produced. At least, we must hope so. The travel pictures are distilled reportage. The narrator, who speaks and acts as Peretz is said to have spoken and acted, travels from the town of Tishevitz, which is about 17 kilometers from Zamosh, from his native city, to Tomashov, about 34 kilometers from Zamosh, interviewing local Jews and offering his impressions. But unlike Peretz, the fictional narrator travels alone and without interference from any of the local officials that we know that the actual Peretz had to see along the way. Typical of Yiddish literature of this period, the text omits Gentiles to present encounters between Jews alone the modern narrator taking professional measure of the townspeople who return his scrutiny with varying degrees of suspicion, curiosity, hostility, and fear. The statistician is staying at the home of an old acquaintance, Reb Boruch, whose house alongside the market square offers a splendid opportunity to eavesdrop on the market women as they discuss his arrival. They say that's him. It's a good thing the poor sheep have shepherds to take care of them. Never mind, if that shepherd won't help us, it's not worth a damn. One woman doesn't understand why that shepherd would choose such messengers, an allusion to my shaven beard and short coat. Another, more liberal, brings the example of a doctor. Take the doctor, she says. He's also a heretic, and yet, that's different. One man, but for the rest, don't we have enough good Jews? They would do us more good, says another, if they sent us a few hundred rubles. I could do without their scribbling, so my son won't be a general. This is the female chorus of Tishevitz. The first woman is pleased that the Jews have champions of their own, shepherds, she calls them, to look after their welfare. The second hasn't a particle of faith in the modern reformers, only in God, the divine shepherd. The third woman suspects anyone who shaves his beard or otherwise deviates from tradition. The fourth, more liberal, points to doctors as proof of the good that modernity can bring. The fifth says, let's not turn the exception into a rule. The occasional doctor may be necessary, but our faith healers, our Hasidic rebbes, are really the best guarantors of life. The last is a simple pragmatist. If they want to help us out of poverty, let them give us money. Her parting shot, so my son won't be a general, conveys her belief that increased dangers rather than increased benefits may well be the result of the inquiry. The male counterpart of this women's chorus is a conversation between the host, Reb Boruch, who has just finished his prayers, and his guest, the, the narrator, who no longer prays, but jo joins him in a lachaim. When Boruch proposes a toast to Parnosse, the decent living that he hopes God will send him, the narrator gets very annoyed. I interrupt him to ask why, though he is a man of faith, though he believes that he who provides life provides food, why in that case he continues to exert himself in his business affairs lying awake nights on end, worrying about the next day, the future, the year ahead. No sooner has a Jew married than he begins to think of wedding clothes for his grandchildren. And yet, when it comes to Kol Yisroel, to his fellow Jews, his faith is so great that he doesn't trouble to put his hand into cold water. You hear here the, the Masfield, the Haskola, the skeptic, the, the doubter. 
but here Reb Baruch answers. That's simple, he says. Kol Yisroel is God's concern, and he is mindful of it. And should there be forgetfulness before the throne of glory, there are holy men to remind him. And then again, how long can it last? There must come an end to this someday, because either the measure of guilt or the measure of merit will be full. But Parnosse is quite another matter. Now, consider the compressed intimacy of these exchanges. I should tell you that uh, reading this passage, I quote it because when I was uh, beginning to study Yiddish literature and I came across this passage, I thought of quitting. I, I understood the words. I did understood nothing about what this passage said. I had to go to my father and ask him um, what, what this possibly could mean. And my father, reading it with the proper intonations up and down, then explained what the words actually meant. So we're not surprised to learn, or at least one might be surprised to learn, but that readers in Peretz's own day had trouble understanding his text and sometimes went to their fathers for explanation. The Aramaic quotation from the Talmud, the half-finished sentences and phrases, the tremendous reliance on nuance, required an insider's familiarity with traditional Yiddish that younger Jews, the modernizing ones who read Peretz's stories, were already losing or had lost. The text conveys the intricacy of ordinary Jewish conversation that contains as many subtleties as a philosophic treatise. When Peretz said that he was writing for a reader like himself, he evidently did not mean to translate the traditional part of himself for the convenience of younger moderns, but quite the contrary, to have them recognize and perhaps even to regret the authentic culture that they were leaving behind. Now, the introduction to Tishevitz in parallel male and female scenes dramatized the conflict between faith and reason, tradition and modernity, that had been the staple of Haskola's of Enlightenment argument. Naturally, Peretz, or the narrator, takes the part of reason in exposing such familiar targets of satire as the superstitious belief in Hasidic faith healers, ignorance of medicine and science, and religious hypocrisy. But Peretz complicates the argument by putting into the mouths of traditional Jews a powerful defense and counterattack. The women have every reason to distrust this modern shepherd because their conservatism is less the result of intellectual confinement than of practical wisdom. And it is a skepticism at least partly shared by the author. Reb Boruch's defense of what the narrator calls his hypocrisy is equally effective. To the apicoiris, the secularist, the choice of all or nothing, either you consign your faith to God or be self-reliant. Either you love your brother or your, like, as yourself or you are no Jew. Reb Boruch replies with real subtlety. Just because God is the ultimate guarantor of meaning, he cannot be held responsible for tomorrow's breakfast. Faith in the moral order of the universe does not preclude a man's anxiety for the fate of his own family. Peretz lets us hear in Reb Boruch's reply to him a fusion of faith and practicality that is both intellectually and psychologically tough, the voice of religious self-reliance that cannot depend for its security on miracles alone. Now, the travel pictures brought into Yiddish literature a gallery of unforgettable characters, like the frail, elderly schooler Rebetzin, who manufactures a primitive kind of soap made of ashes and potato peels in order to maintain her financial independence. Or a motherless little boy who wants God to restore the moon to its former parity with the sun because he feels so sorry for the moon that is being shortchanged in the process. Or the Tishevitz rabbi in his tattered housecoat complaining that the town refuses him the two extra rubles that he needs to maintain himself each week. For all their desperate poverty, these Jews are sweet and trusting in a way that commands respect not only for themselves, but for the teachings that they cite as the inspiration of their way of life. 
The most interesting character, however, turns out to be the narrator himself, initially a mere observer and transcriber of events, and then increasingly an engaged participant. After he has registered his quota of, quote, neglected children tumbling around in the swamp with ducks and geese, tiny babies in their cradles screaming out their throats, sick people abandoned in their beds, boarded out children sitting over their gomorrahs. The statistician admits to the reader and to himself the extent of his inadequacy. And this is a quotation from this. All you gain by statistics is information of an unlicensed public house or a horse thief or a receiver of stolen goods. But does statistics record the anxious heartbeats in the breast of that descendant of the Spanish aristocracy, the son of the Tuas shore, or of any other Jew about to commit his first forbidden act? Does it record how long his heart bled thereafter? Does it measure at least the sleepless nights before and after, or count the days of hunger and the convulsions of cramps that his children suffered before he drew his first unlicensed glass of brandy? These rhetorical questions refer to one of the Jews whom the narrator statistician interviewed, a Jew of good family who set up an illegal home distillery after three of his four children had already died of hunger to save the fourth. Peretz had actually discovered in some of the border towns he visited that many Jews and non-Jews resorted to smuggling and brewing home alcohol to ward off star starvation. If he were to bring these things to light, the report would harm those very people it had intended to protect. Besides, its superficial data would not even suffice as truth because the real quality of human life, including its deepest suffering, cannot be quantified. If the spirit as well as the body is to have its day in court, the imaginative artist would have to supplant the reporter to show that the fate of the Jew is inseparable from his moral struggle. Grounded in material assumptions, the expedition believed in socioeconomic foundation of human society and sought the amelioration of Jewish misery through social, economic, and political improvements. In effect, this seemingly rational idea of progress, Peretz realized, was itself predicated on a species of faith, on faith in the powers of reason and on the goodwill of governments in applying it. Peretz had twice lost his faith, the second time in the fairness of government, and political skepticism revived in him a dialectical appreciation of traditional belief. The real discovery of the traveler is that the small town Jew was not the blind reactionary that earlier Jewish reformers had caricatured, but an admirably moral man or woman delicately balancing faith and doubt, or rather faiths and doubts, not unlike his own. Along with the reformist sympathy we might have expected for the poor and the oppressed, Peretz expresses in these sketches, perhaps for the first time in modern Jewish literature, an intellectual affinity with ordinary traditional Jews. After the expedition had completed its task, Peretz found a job in Warsaw, possibly through the intercession of Jan Bloch himself, and he moved there with his wife in 1890. From then and until his death 25 years later, he was an employee of the Warsaw Jewish Community Council, an organization that administered public aspects of Jewish life and welfare. Like Franz Kafka at a somewhat later date in Prague, Peretz took advantage of the nine to three working day of a functionary to earn a small steady income while devoting his early mornings, late afternoons, and sometimes the better part of the night to his writing. Peretz was a diligent employee. Within a few years, he was put in charge of the cemetery section, where as part of his job, and the story The Dead Town that we were speaking of is written actually uh, about the cemeteries. He writes a great deal about the living as the dead and the dead as the living. 
And in the cemetery division, it was his job to assess family members of the deceased by determining who was faking poverty and who was too proud to take the charity that he needed because both these types came to his door. Instead of traveling among them, Peretz now had all the sectors of Warsaw Jewry streaming in to see him. His friends and colleagues argued over whether this bureaucratic job threatened his creativity by consuming so much of his time and energy, or as his good friend Nachum Sokolov contended, deepened his understanding of the Jews. But judging from his earlier choice of profession and his many later public involvements, Peretz would have sought out an active place in human affairs, if not this job, then another one. His move from the small city to the capital opened broader opportunities in all areas but one. The casual access to various levels of Polish society that he had enjoyed in his legal practice was missing in Jewish community work. Peretz tried to make up at least some of the loss by keeping up with Polish culture, which he deeply, deeply loved. When he began to put out his own Yiddish journals in Warsaw in the early 1890s, he always included translated selections of Polish fiction that dealt sympathetically with the Jews. This was a way of introducing Jewish readers to liberal Polish intellectuals and reminding them that beyond the repressive regime and the nationalist anti-Semites, there were people who believed in tolerance and even brotherhood. But in the absence of any integrated Polish-Jewish intellectual circles, a Jew had to make his choice between the Christian and the Jewish social spheres that widened rather than narrowed as the uh, century drew to a close. Whatever his ambitions of straddling both cultures like a giant colossus, Peretz had to accept the limitations of Jewish society and to try to broaden that society sufficiently to contain all his interests. In this attempt, his aims initially coincided with those of his employers, well-intentioned Polish-speaking Jews with benevolent reformist instincts. The targets of their prescriptive zeal were the Warsaw Jewish masses. During the very first months of his sojourn in Warsaw, Peretz tried to develop a public program under the banner word Bildung, education, that aimed to educate the Jews without driving them away from their Jewishness. He fought simultaneously on several fronts, against anti-Semites who charged Jews with parasitism, against Jews who blindly obeyed the wonder-working tzaddikim and otherwise betrayed what he called their religious chauvinism, and against Jews who saw no further use in Jewish survival. The early publications attest to Peretz's boundless energy and intellectual range, and they're actually, I, I mean, it's really one of the more astonishing uh, feats, to a single issue, one issue of his own magazine, he contributed the following items, and this is not a complete list. The editorial statement of purpose, an idyllic story about the affections of a traditional Jewish husband and wife, a translation from the Psalms, a satire of the disproportionate respect that is accorded to a man who had died rich, having no other accomplishments but his wealth, the sketch of a starving Jewish father and child, a lengthy discourse on the importance of, to society of craftsmen and craftsmanship, a feuilleton on the problems of the Jewish writer, a long narrative poem about a wagoner for whom the decline of his business is the end of a way of life, miscellaneous poems and several items of literary criticism. It was as if he was trying single-handedly to satisfy every kind of Jew, intellectual and worker, women and men, the forward-looking traditionalist and the un unassimilated modern. I am frightened by the sea of our ignorance, he wrote, trying to explain why the one thing that he couldn't handle was the humor column that he had set out to include in the magazine. And he explained it as follows. He said, the Christian writer can afford to be lighthearted because in his open and free world, 
there are relatively unimportant items that lend themselves to casual treatment. Not so the Jewish writer from whom everything is either irrelevant or of desperate and dangerous significance. So our attempt to separate in Peretz the publicist from the creative writer breaks down the minute we examine his writings and find everywhere the concerned educator at work. He was overtly programmatic. He set out to improve, to instruct. There were critics from David Frischman in his own day to Saul Bellow in our day who disliked the preachiness of his stories and what Bellow called their Talmudic sophistication. Yet he could not always suppress his own doubts in the reasonableness of his reason. And it was these unexpected little assaults on his own didactic purpose that endowed some of his stories with a mysterious resonance. Whether out of lingering respect for Jewish religious passion or in protest against the real world that had treated him so shabbily or because of his own twinned impulses of faith and doubt, Peretz always tempered his realism with romantic protest against the authority of realism. And what was true for the body held true for the body politic. Here too, as we shall see, and that's what I hope to develop in the other lectures, Peretz could never settle for the solutions of practical politics alone. The individual spirit, the moral will, and Jewish national survival were not answerable to natural or historical law, and Peretz was ultimately not prepared to sacrifice them for any reductive purpose. This permanent dualism enriched literature and enriched Jewish culture, but it did not work as well in politics where reality was defined and imposed by others. Thank you. <laughs>